this country, particularly when it comes to Africa, we're often pres presented a picture of conflict between warring people. Tribal language is used, whether it's appropriate or not. When you look at the threats to the forest, though, and I'm thinking particularly of Brazil, corporate competition for resources is what's responsible for the overwhelming majority. Talk, if you can, a bit about the role of companies like Archer Daniels Midland and Cargill, who are expanding their investments in um, biofuels and in ethanol and carving up territory in Brazil. And they're the people that sponsor our news, even on our public television. <laughs> I know they're so important and, and, it's, and, and they also uh, sponsor politics. And, and the sad thing is, usually when we talk about the destruction of forests, we talk about the local people. But I can tell you, I've been to the Congo forest. It's not the pygmies who are destroying those forests. It is those companies. And I, I did visit one of the companies, a company that was supposed to be a good company. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed how they are selectively harvesting those trees. But one of the most devastating experiences I had was that when they put down a tree that was over 200 years old. In 10 minutes, it was down. Mm. It came down with so much force, it made me feel like the entire African continent was falling down. Mm. And when I shed tears over those tree, those, that, for, that tree, because I really couldn't take it. And, um, and the man told me, don't worry, there are millions of them out there. And that's the attitude. But they are not really millions of trees we can dispense of. Mm. Then I asked him, how much of it will you use? And he told me, 35%. 35% because they don't want to seek the technology that is available in order to use more of that wood. And they don't want, the many companies want to do what they can do without meeting the competition. So for governments, I'm sure it is, it is very difficult to make these companies uphold a code of conduct so that they use that wood sustainably and most efficiently. They won't do it unless we force them. Rainforest Action says we're losing one and a half acres every second Can you imagine? of every day. Can you imagine? What you've followed in Kenya is a transformation of an economy in your lifetime that I'd love you to talk about. Um, you were the first in your country to receive a doctorate, the first woman. And now you are a regular speaker. I saw you at the social forum in Nairobi in a country that is pretty developed, at least in parts. You are asking your people to think again about the track that they're on. I think we have to do that here too. So I'd like to learn from you. What are you finding works to tell people who are excited about all the products they're being sold and the lifestyle they're being advertised. How do you talk to them about other choices? Well, it is not easy because, you know, we get used to uh, a comfortable life. And as we, as we saw, especially here in America, we can even get to the point where we will spend what we don't have. And then one day somebody says, give it back and you don't have. Uh, and so, first and foremost, we need to learn to live within our means. Mm. And that's not only in America, which is a very uh, rich country, and most of us are always trying to reach them to, to, to experience the American dream. But what we learned during the economic crisis in this country is that you have to learn to live within your means. And, and that we have to learn that the resources out there are limited. Now, in our part of the world, uh, the message is usually you have to live with living within your means so that you do not destroy the environment, mm -hmm. so that you do not, for example, privatize what is public, privatize the forest, privatize public areas, um, break the bank, <laughs> uh, break the treasury to, to, so that you can live a lifestyle that you really don't, cannot mm. afford. Mm. Uh, so it is important for citizens to learn to hold leaders accountable, to learn to participate in the elections. You know, most people sometimes say, oh, it's that 
casting a vote, that's not for me. I don't want to be a politician. So I always tell people, if you're not a politician, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> because the politicians are making decisions about you. So you better know who is going to be your politician. We have people here who spent outside their means because their means could not sustain their lives. And we have a national economy where the means of some tiny minority is equal all the means of everybody else. Do you think we will see fights over resources in this country? E equity is extremely important. I know people don't like to hear equity, but there is a big difference between equity and equal. Mm -hmm. We are not equal as much as we would like to be. And we cannot be equal. And sometimes we are not even equally endowed. The nature doesn't do that to all of us. But it is very important, like in a forest, that everybody get a, a, some light so that you can survive and grow. So even the mushrooms at the very bottom get their part so that they thrive as well as the tree that is at whose canopy is covering the forest. And I think that the rich in our society the powerful in our society have to realize that you can't have it all. It is extremely important. We, it is not a matter of being socialists. I know we are not talking about that. We are talking about justice. We are, we are talking about equitable distribution mm. of resources. And even as we go to Copenhagen, we are saying there must be responsibilities to those who have caused the problem and have become extremely wealthy using a system and a development path that has destroyed the planet. Now they must be willing to spend some of that resources to heal the planet. Equitable distribution of resources is extremely important to all of us. If we don't, those we marginalize, those we set aside, eventually become a burden because they become violent sometimes, or they make it very difficult for us to enjoy our wealth. That is why it is in our interest to promote justice, to promote equity, to promote respect for human rights. One minute, Motanai, what is it? Now, Motanai is a concept that I learned in Japan. I went to Japan and I was trying to talk to the Japanese people about reusing, recycling, reducing, and you know, for a country like Japan, the second most powerful economy in the world, they are used to spending. And they told me they are a bit embarrassed when they are told to reuse because they have too much. But I said, you know what? Some of the resources that you are using, just because you can buy, because you have the money, it's coming from resources that you should be concerned about. If the chopsticks, for example, pick just one little thing like a chopstick, if those throwaway chopsticks that millions are used in Japan, are they coming from the Japanese forest? No. They are probably coming from the Congo, from the Amazon, from Southeast Asia, and you need those forests for your own survival. So can you learn to reuse, reduce, recycle as you used to? before you became so rich. Mm. And they said, well, traditionally, actually, we had this concept that is called motainai. And it, in, it embraces the concept, I thought, so beautiful, because it embraces the concept of respect, which we don't have too much mm. of, gratitude, which we don't have too much of, and an effort not to waste. And, you know, in, in many developed countries, wastage is one of the biggest things that need to be avoided. I hear from you not only a plea for an ecosystem in balance, but an economy in balance. Can we have a healthy planet without changing our financial and economic ecosystem? No, I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that they have to go side, uh, side by side because our economy is based on our environment. And uh, unless we have a healthy environment, we cannot have a healthy economy. And what we need to understand is that sometimes we may sit here in the middle of New York or in the middle of London and think that everything is perfect. But guess what? If everything is 
perfect where you are because you are damaging the environment in other parts of the world, sooner or later, that damage down there or east there or west there is going to come knocking on your door sooner or later. Wangari Matai, thank you so much. 2004 Nobel Peace Prize winner. She spoke this week at the UN Summit on Climate Change.